Hi there and welcome again to this Explaining History Study Extra. Um, as you know, I am a teacher at uh, King's Inter High. It's an online school, very good one. And if you are uh, interested in uh, learning online, you could do a lot worse than to check them out. And this, by the way, is not paid for. They, uh, they don't uh, spare a dime. Uh, I'm just bigging them up because they're my employers and they're cool guys. Anyway, so uh, I tend to create um, little recordings from time to time for students that I have. And today, um, this is goes out to them, but it also goes out to anybody who's studying history anywhere in the world With um, if you're studying the history of the, the Russian Revolution and the development of the Soviet state. So I'm going to talk about um, Lenin, his testament, his death, and the, the the last couple of years of his life, and the kind of the consequences in the establishment of the power struggle, which is concluded uh, with the accession of Stalin to supreme power by 1928. So um, a lot of this is kind of interconnected with the events of the Russian Civil War. Okay, so obviously, um, October 1917, the Bolsheviks come to power, and from 1918 to about 1921, 22, there's a civil war, um, which, up until 1920, it's not certain the Bolsheviks will win. Lenin has to put, it has to bring about extreme policies in order to ensure that victory. One of them being war communism which is the total control of the of the economy, the total control of um, working time and workers' rights, the abolition, essentially, of, work, of, of any kind of workers' rights that emerged as a result of the Soviets in uh, 1917, uh, and the control of the food system. So it, it is the first great looting of the peasants. The second one, of course, is collectivization. And when the Civil War ends, and Trotsky, and I paraphrase here, essentially says we, we won the Civil War, but we had to destroy the country in order to, to do it. Um, Lenin, by the end of the Civil War, uh, is seriously unwell. He's had uh, a number of strokes. Um, this wasn't helped by the fact that he was shot several times in 1918 by the uh, social revolutionary assassin uh, Fania Kaplan, um, and um, the, some of the bullets were never fully re- retrieved from his, his body. He was very, very lucky to survive. Um, as Lenin um, grew more and more unwell, and was less and uh, more and more frail, uh, was less able to um, engage in, um, in in political life. Um, it became more difficult to discern what the future held. Um, in 1921, following the um, Kronstadt uprising, the Antonov peasants revolt uh, and the workers um, uh, the, the, the workers movement within the party um, Lenin essentially says uh, that uh, particularly with the Kronstadt revolt that this is a, a bolt of lightning that has illuminated the entire landscape we can now see the extent of opposition to us in Russia we can now see the, the, the fact that we will not survive for very much longer unless we have a, a temporary and strategic withdrawal um, there is huge debate over um, what was meant, uh, what Lenin intended with his next policy, which was obviously the uh, new economic policy. The new economic policy was um, Lenin's strategic withdrawal. He said that we will hold on to the commanding heights of the economy, uh, steelworks, coal mines, railways, you know, the, the stuff of kind of industrial capitalism or now industrial revolutionary socialism. Uh, but we will allow small-scale uh, profiteering amongst the peasants. They'll be able to keep grain surpluses, which we've been uh, looting from them. Um, and there will be um, a, a, a small degree of free enterprise that um, small shops, bars, cafes, restaurants, that kind of thing, will be able to proliferate. And um, Lenin, because he dies in 1924, never specifies how long this was meant to last. And it's, it's kind of speculation 
it, we can only speculate how how long actually Lenin Lenin intended. Uh, my sense is that probably he thought in order to rebuild Russia, you would need to allow the NEP to last for a very long time. You know, a matter of decades. Um, the creation of the NEP policy divides the Bolshevik party. There are those on the left that say we this was a war to eradicate capitalism. Um, there are the more pragmatic Bolsheviks that say, well, yeah, but you know, we if we destroy if we rip up all markets and all market mechanisms, the country will survive. The country will starve. It will collapse, and then our uh, very hostile neighbours will simply march in and overthrow the revolution as easy as that um, Lenin is Le- Lenin gives no indication of, of this and because he gives no indication of what's meant to happen with the most fundamental issue of the day i.e. how the economy is meant to function and who in, in whose interest it's meant to function um, that gives Stalin uh, an opportunity when he um, comes to power, or when, uh, throughout the process of him coming to power by 1928, Le- Stalin essentially answers the question in 1928 of what the future direction of the Soviet economy will be, and he um, answers that with uh, collectivization and the the five year plans. But we we're, we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, Lenin made uh, a number of contributions to Stalin's uh, to Stalin's accumulation of power. Um, the first was making Stalin general secretary of the party. Um, Trotsky often used to kind of deride this as a, a, a kind of plodder's job, but it's a job in which Stalin was able to accumulate huge amounts of information and therefore power. Um, he was given the power of um, appointing party secretaries and party bosses uh, across the country and therefore he was able to build a gigantic network of um, supporters based on patronage he would spend hours in his office with his pipe um, going through lists of people to be removed from jobs and going through lists of people to be uh, uh, appointed and if you imagine what life would have been like in the early 1920s in Russia. The party and party membership is the way you can guarantee access to two things. Accommodation, a nice apartment to live in, and food. Um, and at the same time, uh, well, the thing is, this is always, it's always kind of existed in Russia, but networks of patronage emerged based on uh, party membership and uh, party favoritism. If you knew somebody who was the boss in Voronezh or somewhere like that, then you were able to kind of leverage that and get yourself uh, an apartment. Uh, often it might involve the eviction of somebody else. Um, but scarce resources required this this these party networks. There's a Russian term called blat. You know, if you have blat, it means you have connections. And, and you can uh, leverage those. So because so Stalin appoints party loyalists across Russia, noticeably Trotsky doesn't do this. Trotsky has a network, a small network of people who agree with him, other intellectuals and journalists and, and party members. But it's no, it is as nothing compared to the gigantic... Uh, network that Stalin creates. So Stalin was very good at building the groundwork for himself uh, to uh, bring bring about his e- eventual rise to power. The other thing that Lenin brings about uh, before he dies, 1921, is a ban on factions in the party. Now we know that um, obviously Russia is a one-party, uh, the Soviet Union is a one-party state, and that the Bolshevik Party or now the Communist Party are in charge. However, in early earlier conceptions of what uh, a one-party state might look like, many Bolsheviks imagined that there would be uh, in sort of inner party debate, so that the democracy, for want of a better word, would be. Uh, different voices from within the Bolsheviks putting forward different ideas as to how 
um, Russia should develop as as a new society. Oh, but um, the that would necessitate other parties, potentially counter-revolutionary parties, being banned because all they will do is try to overthrow you and bring about another bloody civil war. However, by about 1921, um, the, the the kind of the pressures of the civil war. Lenin's own personality as a kind of very controlling, very suspicious individual meant that more and more decision making was concentrated in his hands and his hands alone, taken out of um, the the kind of the debate that the that happened within the party or debates that within the party, and he would simply make make decisions on his own. And when this was um, objected to, Lenin banned factions and said that. If people form factions, which could be as innocuous as two members of the party having a, a private chat about something or other uh, over in the corner, um, that they could be expelled from the party. And Stalin uses this later on to expel all sorts of dissenting voices from the party. Getting expelled from the Bolshevik party, or the Communist Party as it becomes, is a more serious deal than you know, if one was expelled from a, a party in a democratic country. Not only do you lose the privileges that come with being in the party, but you also, lose, you, you also become a figure of suspicion. You become the sort of individual who uh, winds up on the radar of the various secret police, various iterations of the secret police, from the Cheka to the OGPU to the NKVD. Um, and those people who were expelled in the 1920s, their name went on a list. And when the Great Terror came around from 1936-37 onwards, they were on the list to, the first on the list to be arrested. Or, you know, at the t at high up the list to be arrested. So expulsion from the party was a very, very serious business. When Lenin died, Lenin left a, his political testament. Now, there's an interesting thing written that's been written, re not I say recently, in the last 10 years, by a historian called Stephen Kotkin, who argues that Lenin's political testament couldn't possibly have been written by him. He was too unwell. In the, the, in the, the, the time period that we imagine it was written or even dictated, Lenin couldn't actually speak. And Stephen Kotkin puts the theory uh, that um, uh, Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, uh, was probably the person that wrote the political testament. We may never know, um, but it's, it's an interesting thesis anyway. Most historians go with the idea that it probably was Lenin's political testament. Again, it's difficult to see you know how how it got to be uh, dictated but you know who knows in it the members of the um uh, the the existing members of the politburo are all roundly criticized and we'll in another podcast we'll look at um these individual members there had originally been four kind of key figures before during the the civil war who had um um, managed the revolution, which was Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, and Yakov Sverdlov. And Sverdlov dies during the civil war. But by 1924, you have obviously Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, and Bukharin. Um, everybody is roundly criticised in Lenin's political testament, but none more so than Stalin. When the um, when the the members of the Politburo look at the political testament following um, Lenin's death, they choose to bury it. They choose not to publish it. And when they do this, this plays into Stalin's hands. Everybody in it would have been discredited to some degree but Stalin would have been politically finished by what Lenin has to say and one of Stalin's key claims is that he was the inheritor of Lenin's wisdom 
Lenin, who has been raised to a kind of almost cult-like figure um, in uh, in Russia, um, who who is mourned um, by um, thousands who are, after he dies, being seen to be the inheritor of Le- the Leninist tradition is very very important. And for Stalin to have been directly criticised by Lenin, uh, um, who calls him sort of ignorant and uncouth and not suitable to wield power in in Russia. Stalin had been very rude and abusive to uh, Lenin's wife, to Nadezhda Khrushchev, um, which is perhaps where um, uh, uh, Lenin had misgivings uh, uh, about him. For this to have been made public would have been would have been catastrophic. When Lenin uh, died, uh, his fu- his state funeral uh, was held, and Trotsky doesn't make the funeral. Um, there are all sorts of theories about this. One is that Stalin told him the wrong day, which to me seems fanciful. Um, someone like Leon Trotsky, who successfully managed most of the war effort of the of the Bolshevik armies, to be caught out like that and not to check things uh, seems to be uh, unrealistic. The historian Orlando Figes, in his book uh, Russia, a People's Tragedy, which as a kind of an overview of the Russian Revolution is always a good reader. He argues that Trotsky perhaps unconsciously maybe was, was showing that he wasn't interested in power itself. Leon Trotsky it was a really professional revolutionary. He was somebody who advocated to um, the rest of to Russia and to, to the, the the Communist Party and to the rest of Russia that the the, the the future direction of the Russian Revolution was to spread itself to have what Trotsky called permanent revolution. Trotsky was less than less comfortable settling down as a government minister or even a, a future leader of Russia and wanted to be um, involved in, in, in permanent revolution. Um, this perhaps explains why he is kind of almost self-sabotages in, in this way and doesn't turn up to Lenin's funeral. This is considered to be an act of gross disrespect and something that Stalin uses against Trotsky. We'll look at the uh, the battle between Stalin and Trotsky perhaps another time. The other way of uh, um, thinking about um, the difference between Stalin and Trotsky is this question of permanent revolution, which Trotsky advocates, versus what Stalin suggests is, is socialism in one country. Um, and again, this, this is how Stalin breaks away from, um, the, uh, f- from um, the rest of the party and, and presents um, a, a vision of what the Soviet Union could be like. There's this um, unsh- insecurity and this, this lack of clarity about where the Soviet Union is going. And Stalin says, here's what we should do. Socialism in one country involves the building of um, socialism. In the in sort of Marxist dialectics, the idea is once the socialist revolution happens, you have a long period of kind of hard work and struggle, and you know the, the communist promised land is somewhere over the horizon, uh, where you know you live in this kind of abundant utopia. But Stalin said, you know, we we've got to go through the long period of building up industry in the Soviet Union and particularly for defence because the counter-revolutionaries they will come for us eventually Uh, they've done it, they've tried it a couple of times they will come for us eventually uh, and they will they will bring, be there to kind of put down the revolution and later on in the 1930s Stalin's explanation for who Hitler is really, he says that you know Hitler is the kind of counter-revolutionary attack dog of the capitalist classes which is kind of a misunderstanding of Hitler Um, Stalin doesn't believe in permanent revolution and thinks that Russia's in no shape to be spreading spreading itself revolutionary wise and also 
after the Russian Revolution, there is a wave of possible kind of halfway house revolutions in Russia, in places like Hungary uh, and Germany, and they, they don't succeed. By the early 1920s, it's clear that revolutionary socialism is not going to spread from Russia. And so instead, defending the country, um, building up large armies and heavy war industries is Stalin's solution. And this is the I, this is what wins out in the end in the, the power struggle. OK, I hope you found that useful um, and I'll be doing another regular podcast later today. So thanks, all the best and uh, take good care. Bye bye.